Hi, guys. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, great to be here. Second year I've been to Slush, yep. so happy to be back. So today we are talking about corporate venturing. I think it's really important for the benefit of everyone here. Could you just give us an up-to-date definition of what exactly corporate venturing is and what's, what's the kind of level of scale that you're at at the moment? Um, so, I mean, the, the general definition of corporate venturing is uh, investment with a strategic goal. I can, we can talk more about what that means um, for Salesforce, but we've been doing this for about nine years. I've been at Salesforce for a little over five, and we have uh, over 230 portfolio companies globally across um, 18 countries. We have all investment professionals um, in London, uh, Japan, San Francisco. And um, yeah, we have about a, over a billion on the balance sheet um, that we've invested, so we've, we've been very active. Had, and you've had a number of successes already. We have. In terms of, tell me about some of the companies you've had that I'm sure many yeah. people here will know. We, we've been very fortunate. We've invested in a lot of good companies. I think they announced some. But um, we had a number of IPOs this year. We've had uh, 15 in total. We've had 60 M&A activities, but uh, MuleSoft, DocuSign, Anaplan, Twilio, HubSpot. So we've, we've been very fortunate to invest in a number of fantastic companies. And what, what sort of stage, what kind of level do you get involved in these companies? We're pretty broad in terms of stage, but we typically our first investment that we make is a Series A, Series B company. Um, but we can go all the way to our first investment when Twilio was uh, pre-IPO. But the way we think about it is uh, we're investing kind of at the stage when, they're, when you're at a company and you're thinking about who, who's the right partner for me, um, and you have a product, you're in market, and you're starting to see, for us, you see Salesforce as a, as a viable partner. Um, you, customers are asking for product integrations. So that's the stage where we get involved. So sometimes we'll do seed, but typically not. And do you see yourselves as complementary to venture capital and other funding? Absolutely. So typically, we're not leading investments. Um, we invest alongside all of the leading venture capital firms. We uh, work with you on an event with Bessemer Venture Partners. Uh, we work with Excel and Sequoia and many of the leading venture capital firms. And so they like having us in um, because we're able to help provide some additional scale and growth to the business and help them navigate Salesforce. And so if there's, if there's anyone out here today who's interested in actually exploring a corporate venturing option with someone like Salesforce. Just walk me through the process. How does it, how sure. does it start? How does the conversation start? Sure. It's, you know, it's not too dissimilar to typical institutional venture capital, but I'd say the different thing is, is um, you know, if you're thinking about working with a large company, and so a lot of the advice I'll say is like, how, what are the best practices for, for working with large companies? If you're, a, if you're a startup, how do you want to get noticed by, by someone who's going to be a partner? And the first thing is, is really, you're kind of selling them to a certain extent, being able to tell that story. Uh, if you can come in and say, here's the mutual customers we have, here's what our product does, we think this will really augment your solution and make your customers happier. And that's, that's really the lens that we look at is how are we going to make a, by working together, make our customers more successful. So if you can tell that story, we can help augment that and drive greater product integration and get greater line, but it's really coming in and having that notion of how, you know, coming in is really with the mindset, how can, how can we help you and your customers? So it really is a mutual relationship, beneficial it is, on both it sides. It is a mutual relationship. And, and how much physical um, interaction do you have? Is it, are you moving into an accelerator or is it just keeping in touch? How does it work day to day? So there's various phases. So the first stage is, um, it's the investment stage, and that's where for, for every investment we have, we have a general manager or someone who runs product. And so we start really with, with the product integration. Um, again, very much a customer-centric approach, and we think about how do we, you know, the nature of Salesforce, it's a platform company. Companies can integrate through App Exchange, or they can um, um, build on our platform. And so we think about how, how can you have those solutions that are really going to going to um, augment customers. So that's it really starts with product and then we enable them in the ecosystem and then we think more about the tactical technical integration and then there's things that we do on the go to market side and enable them in the market uh, after that. So I, I want to move the conversation on to, to Europe because I know you spend a lot of time across your year coming yeah. in and out of you've been to slush before you yes. go over to London. Yes. Europe is a very different landscape compared to the valley where you were predominantly based in San Francisco. 
what trends are you seeing at the moment in Europe that are making you excited from your investor perspective? Um, I think just generally we're seeing a lot of really good enterprise technology. Um, I've been coming to Europe actively for about five years. And we're seeing, a tr in each of the countries we're going, we're just seeing a, a tremendous amount of enterprise companies, um, particularly in machine learning, AI, um, some of the industry verticals, financial services, particularly in London. Um, so I think just overall, and, and even in the US, outside of the valley, I think you're, you're seeing a lot of enterprise companies really pop up, and there's a lot of viable startup hubs you know, outside of California and the Silicon Valley. So that's been really encouraging. Is there anywhere in Europe that you'd particularly point towards as um, an area of excitement for you, geographically, any um, cities? It, it depends on, on what we're looking for. Um, but you know, we've made three investments in the Nordics. Uh, we made one in Finland. The, the company was, uh, was acquired not too long ago. Um, we've been spending a lot of time in France, a lot of time in Germany, a lot of time in the UK. So it's all, the way we think about it, we follow where we have, where do we have our largest customers? Um, and that's, that tends to be where we invest. And how, how do you find these startups? Are they coming to you or are you finding them? Well, so I'm fortunate we have an amazing head of EMEA um, who's here, Alex Kayal, and he runs, he runs our EMEA. Um, he's, he's local, based, well, he's based in London. Um, so, but it's a combination of a lot of VCs will bring us companies, um, you know, out meeting with companies, coming to conferences like this, meeting with startups the whole time we're here. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what would you say culturally are the differences you see? You've had five years of coming between the Valley and, and Europe. What, what would you say stands out or is different to uh, working with startups here? Um, well, I would say very uh, specific to, to Finland. Um, the startups are very transparent and very honest with exactly what they can and can't do, whereas <laughs> in Silicon Valley, um, they tend to stretch the truth a little a bit, bit. A little bit more hustling in the valley? Uh, yeah. You could call it, hustle's a, yeah. hustle's a good word for it. Um, <laughs> there's probably a balance, but, but you know, they'll say, well, we're the number two player. This other player, they beat us because they have better sales and marketing, like just brutally honest, which yeah. you'd never see that in the valley. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've, in, in my own experience as someone who's covered this area for over a decade, it is interesting. So many parts of Europe, I think we're more humble and sometimes we, yes. don't, we don't puff ourselves up enough. Yes. You know, we're not going to, well. you know, I've, I've, I've seen English people trying to do fundraising and they'd be like, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm sorry for asking <laughs> for money. Well, I, I'm from, not from California. I grew up in Kentucky, kind of the south meets the Midwest. And it's a similar mentality. Really? Just like, yeah, not as, not as uh, um, I guess as they say, uh, uh, all hat and no cattle is, is, is the expression. <laughs> I've never heard that one before. Not in California, that's more of a Texas term. <laughs> so do you, do you think it's a refreshing change than actually that honesty? I think that's a really interesting point. The not being afraid to say that you're number two in the market. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, yeah, it is, it is. <laughs> Um, what, what's on the outlook for you for the rest of the year and in terms of, you mentioned AI and machine learning. Are there any other areas that you think are important to Salesforce Ventures? So we, we do spend a lot of time um, on industry verticals, financial services, um, healthcare, life sciences. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's been a tremendous growth area. We've been, um, we launched an impact fund last year. And, and it's almost like a different industry vertical. We've had our, um, the nonprofit side of Salesforce in, investing in um, NGOs, universities, higher ed, and, and that continues to grow. And I think you're just sort of seeing enterprise software um, becoming more dispersed. Um, we're, we're looking still a decent amount at, at, at AR, VR technologies. It's still very early. I feel like I have to say blockchain. We've, we've dabbled in blockchain a little bit, but the-, uh, have, the you, break have you got blockchain fatigue? Uh, no, because no. I haven't really, like, I haven't dived in. It feels like from, from an enterprise standpoint, I think we're pretty early in that cycle. Um, and that's, that's where I think why AI and machine learning is really interesting, because um, you're at a point now where uh, you don't have to have a, a, a massive team of data scientists to be able to do this. Platforms are, are delivering it. Many of the companies here are, are, are delivering that through a pretty readily consumable platform. We have our Einstein platform, so if you want to do AI machine learning with CRM data, um, you can use our Einstein. You can build an application and build that in. And so, again, you're taking, you're, you're abstracting away some of the complexity. Um, but then alongside that, we're also seeing a lot of really interesting things to help um, sort of not the uh, nerdiest and geekiest of the data science, uh, do more data science-y stuff, ma manage data science, cataloging it, um, joining data together. So I think a lot of that stuff is getting uh, uh, more, it's, it's becoming simpler and more available to, to, to the average developer as opposed to like a, a hardcore data scientist.
And I want to touch a little bit more on that, that relationship between a corporate and a startup. Yeah. So um, as I think uh, they mentioned in the introduction, I had a startup myself. I've been based in a corporate yeah. accelerator. And I, th I think being based there for two years among other startups, yeah. I think it's uh, very interesting in my own experience in London that um, there are some corporates who see it as very short-termist. There are some startups who think that moving into a corporate accelerator equals instant contracts and you know, you're going to, yeah. that's a customer for life. Yes. Like, let's, let's talk a little bit about what the reality is. What, what, yeah. what is a good example for you? So, I mean, I think this is what we were talking about before is, is you, you, you have to treat, so when you're coming and you want to work with a large company, if you're the small company, you have to treat it like it's your first large enterprise sales deal. You have to treat it like a sales process. So you have to come in. You need to be able to sell the value. Why should they work with you? Um, I think is key. I think it's things like uh, you, know, you, can't, you can't take on. Um, and, and so what that means is you just have, you have to apply a lot of resources um, to it. It just, doesn't, it just doesn't come. It just doesn't work. You have to put a lot, of, a lot of energy into it to really make it work. And in some ways, I'd say um, pay it forward um, a little bit. And so you can tick through all the things that that means, but from a, from a resourcing and staffing, I mean, if you're serious about a partnership, um, you should have, you know, at least someone who's 25, 50% of their job is like this partner. And again, don't have a whole bunch of partners out of the gate, pick one or two. Um, you need to think about how are, you, how are you positioning your product alongside them? And it's an iterative cycle. You need to make sure that, you know, the, the, the salespeople, the solution engineers, um, the product people, they understand how your product fits with theirs, and it's not, it's, and it's, and it's, and it's positioned um, properly. Um, as, as a CEO, you should, you know, you can't just hand that relationship off and let your BD person manage it. They could, they could do a lot of it, but if it's a really important relationship, you know, you need to follow up and nurture it. Again, it's like once you sell to an account, you need to follow up. You need to try and continually upsell, upsell, upsell. Um, and and these are very dynamic relationships and so the person that brought you in who you may have the partner partner with that person may leave um, and so you want to make sure that you know you have all the touch points within the company and, and when you mentioned dynamic relationships and something I, I know so well from my yeah. own experience startups run at one pace bigger companies run at another how are you going to balance that difference in speed and execution um, I mean the company's a it's, it's a slow moving battleship and so you just, it's again, it's just like sort of making that first sale. You, you gotta just keep chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And, and then, you know, once you, once you get that partnership and once you get that in, you just have to keep working it. Um, and, I guess and it's a lot about culture really as well. It is, it is, about, it is about culture. You have to, you have to understand um, the company. You have to understand what your value is to the company, what's important to the company that you're working with. And it's gonna be different for each company. Yeah. And I guess it's like about keeping that communication open, yes. managing those expectations as well. Yes, very yeah. much so, very much Can so. Can you share any like, great examples of where relationships have really grown and blossomed? Yeah, um, so I can start with, with big ones and small ones, because we, we span the gamut of, of um, and so we, uh, one that probably everyone knows is a company, Twilio, um, and it's an it's a API communication layer. And we, we invested and partnered with them kind of in their last round before IPO, um, and now that's like the fabric for all of our kind of communication where we're doing, doing any sort of inbound and outbound telephony. Um, that's been, that's been uh, for like sales and service use cases, that's been um, phenomenally successful. Um, we've been a, we were an early investor in, in MuleSoft, which is um, integration layer. It was a, a 8 billion, uh, a, well, we, we ended up acquiring it, but it was a public company as well. Um, and, and, you know, that was more of, uh, we worked together in, with, with, with customers. Um, maybe another good example is a company that's uh, in the retail space, Narvar. And what they do is they give you that, and we, we, we partnered with them kind of in their, you know, a little bit early in the, in, in the cycle of that company. And they, they deliver a um, experience like if you're, like at Amazon, if you're going to order a package um, and you know, like, uh, if I order, if I use this delivery service and I pay this much, it'll be here by this date. And, and then the notifications of when you're going to get your package. So you don't, have to, you don't have to bounce out to the carrier, whether it's FedEx or UPS. You can kind of keep that experience all within uh, your, your e-commerce application. And so we provide an e-commerce um, platform. And so again, that's a company where there's like really clear um, product integration. And, and that's another one that we've worked with. And I guess as part of your role, you're out there meeting startups from time to time, engaging yes. with them. 
can you just, just paint the picture for me? What is a dream first meeting with a startup? What, what, what words do you want to hear? Um, here's your mutual customers. Here's how we're thinking about build, integrating in your product. We think we would be a fit for you know, product A with inside Salesforce, product B with inside Salesforce, product C. And we think this is going to make both of our customers a lot more successful. That's kind of the first thing. And then once, once we kind of check that, then we want to like meteoric growth, great CEO, all the stuff that a traditional institutional venture capitalist would want to see. But so we, we kind of want to see both of those things. And can I flip that around and turn it? And then what, what do you not want to hear? What, what's your turn offs? Well, personal? it's kind of what you were saying is like, I think a lot of uh, companies will come to a, a corporate, whether it's a VC or a corporate, and just say, hey, you know, we do this really cool stuff. How can you, how can you grow my business? Like, we're really cool. And so they sort of come in and think that, you know, that as a small company, you're going to be like the highest priority right away, and we're, we're going to take you and start marching you into all of the accounts. So it's really, I think there's a, a, a realism that needs to be baked in that says, you know, I'm committed. I'm going to make this relationship work. I'm going to make this partnership successful. Um, and what's interesting is one of the things I found is um, that those CEOs that are good at partnering and navigating relationships um, with large companies, because if you think about it, it's a pretty complicated relationship to manage. You need to know how to speak to marketing. You need to speak to product, to sales. You need to know how much time to spend with who. Who's the right people? Are you talking to the right decision makers? It's a very complex relationship. And I've, and I've seen consistently, those CEOs that do that the best, if you say the top 25%, 10%, they're also the best portfolio companies. They're, it's, it's a very clear sign of a good CEO. You're making it sound a bit like a marriage or, you know, like a... I mean, all, all, these, all these partnerships are marriages in one way or the other. Well, what's been the most memorable one, memorable one for you personally? Um, the most memorable partnership for me personally? Um, let me think. I, you know, it's, it's, it's always hard to, uh, to pick, pick one out. favorites. I would say, um, you know, one of the ones that was uh, one, of, one of my first investments at Salesforce was, was MuleSoft. And, um, you know, they weren't a super small company at the time, but, you know, they went on, again, to, to be a multi-billion dollar um, public company, incredibly successful company by their own right. We ended up acquiring them for um, multiple billions, and it's been a very successful acquisition. And so that one is, um, and, and the CEO, it wasn't before, but the CEO, Greg Schott, happens to uh, live down the street from me as well. Um, so I ride with him to work now sometimes. But um, uh, so that one was, was um, memorable on, on multiple dimensions. And tell me a bit more about um, Europe as well. Um, is there anything that you th expect to see in the next 12 months looking ahead into the future in terms of corporate relationships and startups? Are you, could you point to any other great examples from other corporate venture arms? Um, so the first question was, what are examples of... If of, of where do you think the trend is at the moment with corporate yeah. venturing? Um, well, I mean, I think in, in, in Europe specifically, um, um, you know, we talked about some of the trends. I think Europe tends to be ahead in GDPR and privacy and security. Um, but some of the trends in, in, in corporate venturing, it's, it's becoming an increasingly important part of um, the overall capital because I think so many businesses, we see this, that, that everyone's going through this sort of digital transformation. And so you typically think of like companies like Netflix coming in and disrupting um, a company like Blockbuster. Um, I, I don't know if everyone, maybe Blockbusters, okay. Um, but, but what you also see is that on the enterprise side, con, you know, sort of legacy businesses, those that adopt technology first and adopt it well, they create that same sort of div digital divide between their, their competitors as well, and you see them being rewarded um, in the stock market for it. And so I think for that reason, um, a lot of these companies are trying to figure out, like, how do I get my head around being, you know, I don't want to say every business is a tech company because that's, I don't think that's true, but I think every business is trying to become like a sort of a tech forward or very much a tech enabled business. Um, and so I think as part of that, corporate venturing is, is playing an increasingly important role. A lot of people I've heard say that European startups aren't ambitious enough. We're not thinking about, you know, global ambitions that are huge, going over to the US and entering the market. Would you agree? Um, I think you see that sometimes less and less. Um, and I think that's one of the interesting things is that you see a lot of startups 
um, particularly in the enterprise side, will will start in Europe and then and then come to the U.S. when they're going to raise a Series A, Series B. I think that's one of the I don't want to say challenge. It's it's actually becoming a great. Uh, I think it's very attractive for us, an attractive asset, because um, maintaining and keeping talent in the, in the Bay Area is really, really challenging now. And so I, you know, I never thought that having an R&D team in France would be you know, more economical than having one in the US. Um, but it's, it's becoming the case. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that f f from that standpoint, I mean, you're seeing, like, look, there's a number of, of very ambitious companies um, in, in Europe. And, and I think that trend's only going to continue. Uh, and would you, realistically, would you consider partnering with a company that, let's say, its real addressable market size is just the Nordic, somewhere as small as that? Um, in some rare cases, we on the services side, we, we have a lot in the past. But no, I think we're typically, when we're investing in companies, we want to see them be able to, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll invest in a company that there be, might be comparable, and one's very much focused on Europe broadly, and the other one's focused on North America. We're fine with that. If it's just kind of like a very regional, it gets harder. It's, it's harder for those businesses to really grow and have a, a substantial impact. And, and as you said, it's, it's, you're looking at places where your customers already are, and it's that's about right. fusing those two things together. Right, and the flip side is, is that if there's another company that's more ambitious, that's you know, based in, in, in France, and they, they want to dominate all of Europe, um, they're going to end up being a better company than the one that's, you know, um, you know, based in Estonia and only wants to service Estonia. Yeah. And, and we're just coming up to our last few uh, seconds, actually. But I think for the benefit of people who are here, could you tell them how you would like to be approached and how you people could start a relationship with Salesforce? How, how should they start that? Um, so I, I kind of, as I mentioned, is, is being able to, um, just like you would want someone to approach you, you would want them to be familiar with who you are, what you do, kind of investments you've made in the past, how you operate, you know, do your homework up front and then sort of come in with saying, you know, anytime I've tried to get a job or I've tried to sell something, you, you always want to come in with a, you know, how can I help you um, approach. I think that's a very humble and great way to, to, to start out. Um, that's, that, that's what I would do if, um, whenever I'm approaching, if, you know, when I'm trying to sell into a startup and it's a company that doesn't need our capital, that's the, that's the thing I do is I, I kind of have in my mind like, hey, this is how we can work together. Brilliant. I think that's a wonderfully positive point to finish. Matt Garrett, thank you so thank much you for joining much. us. Thank All you. Right. Thanks.